Now we're on to the good stuff. We are move, going to move on to the iOS and the Android app setup. This is this is the really uh, this is the sexy stuff. This is the stuff that uh, everybody's sort of been wanting. The back end's cool and everything like that. It's actually the heart and soul of it. To me, it's actually the most important part. Um, but users can't really use it. So we're going to move on to the generator. So we'll exit out of that server. Never have to log into that again. But we'll keep it running in the background because obviously you have to. And the next steps, this is where things actually get like more complicated because it depends on the setup of your machine. So if your machine is completely new, you've never used anything on it, you've never done any sort of development work on it, uh, there's going to be a couple extra steps that I would like to go over, but they take a little bit more time. And I also did them all on this machine yesterday and was unable to wipe the machine last night uh, in any sort of time. I think there's something wrong with the recovery portion on it. So it's already been set up to run everything, but I'm going to go over the steps to do that again anyways for those of you who are doing this from scratch and have never actually worked in development or maybe just have done a lot of JavaScript or something but never done any system development. Okay, now the nice thing is, okay, let's close out of these. Again, there we go. So the nice thing is, it is just as before, fully documented. Now what we want to do is we want to use the generator. So there's three parts to this. There's the generator, the iOS, and the Android app. The iOS and Android app do not work by themselves. They have to use the generator to actually take everything that you want, all of your na your name, your logos, your colors, everything, and it puts it into the app properly. If you just do a pull on the push iOS or push Android and try to put it into Xcode or Android Studio and launch it, you're going to fail. Uh, it's going to error out in many fantastic and meaningful, meaningless ways to you uh, because there's going to be a bunch of files missing. So the first thing, the first place that we start here is we start on the generator. Okay. So this is a custom uh, set of code in Ruby and a bunch of other stuff that I wrote myself. And this, and then it also uses something called Fastlane to actually do the final builds. But we're going to just go through this real quickly. The steps are, again, fully documented. Um, but there's a couple things that we're going to stop. Start. So the first thing is you need to install what's called Homebrew. If you were watching the previous backend section, you saw we use something called apt-get. And it's essentially the same thing, but for Macs. Uh, oh, one thing I forgot to mention. To do this, you have to have a Mac, unfortunately. To build iOS apps, you have to be running on a Mac. Uh, the Android step should work on other systems. I have not tested it. Um, I would not recommend it. If you're going to do this properly, you have to get a Mac and follow these steps. So the first thing is you're going to want to install Homebrew. This is really simple. You just copy and paste this over. You say yes, and you type in the password. And what that gives you is set up to this a program called Brew. This lets you very easily install things. So just to show you, we'll do Brew install git. Even though I have it already installed here, it'll probably just yell at me in a second after updating. Though I did it last night. This is, once again, just pulling all the code changes that exist online to make sure that your system is most up to date when it's trying to install new things. Let's see, is there anybody commenting anything? Hey, three people watching it. Thanks, folks. Hmm. 
<laughs> Just gonna let this play out. Just takes a minute. Okay, there we go. So it says already installed and up to date, which is great. We don't need to do anything about that. We'll do the same thing with GPG if you're just setting this up, which basically, again, allows you to just verify pa packages so you know that someone is not posting a false one or a fake one that might have been tampered with at some point in time. Not really a big issue for most people, but uh, good practice and lesson to get into anyways. For step four, we install RVM. So Mac OS comes shipped with a version of Ruby. It is usually out of date, not the newest version in any way, shape, or form. And installing new versions often gets convoluted and complicated. And to get around that, there's some people that created this project called RVM. Now, there's another one called RBE and ENV. Uh, they both work fine. I personally prefer RVM. No real reason. Uh, but these are the setup instructions to actually do it. And this allows you to replace the system Ruby without completely nuking your, your entire operating system on accident. It's very easy. Just, again, copy and paste these over, follow the instructions, and you'll see that it all works. So th then we want to install the newest Ruby versions. Okay, so... Uh, I guess I forgot to mention this before, but I, as I go through this, I'm actually going to be editing this a little bit. If I notice I missed something somewhere or another, and I notice that I missed something right here. Okay. Basically, I gave some set some steps that don't really make a whole lot of sense if you haven't actually uh, done it. <laughs> It's going to just break. Basically, I'm telling it to pull the Ruby version that's in the repository, but I haven't told you to actually pull the Ruby, the uh, repository yet. So we're going to do that. Just let me add this. Otherwise, I will forget it. Okay. Okay, so that will be updated after after the whole thing's done. So we're just going to do that real quickly. We're going to do get clone. See, I put it all the way at step seven. Should have been a little bit earlier. Okay. Now we go in there, and we continue following the steps. This is probably going to say that, oh, you already have it installed because I do, uh, but that would normally download it. It would compile Ruby, which would take a while, so I'm glad that it actually already is set. Um, let's make sure that we have everything set here, and there's a typo. Of course, always typos. Okay, we set that. And we make sure that we install Bumbler. And we should see Ruby 2.5.0, just like there, which is perfect. That's what we wanted. And what this does is it allows me to update the Ruby version that's required automatically, uh, and then these instructions stay together forever. Okay, so the next thing we do is we install image magic. This lets us move the, uh, lets us resize the images, change their color, all automatically. So anything that you set in the upcoming configuration files will happen for you. So you don't need to use Photoshop or anything like that to rearrange things. So now that we have that done, we've already pulled the code. I'm moving that step up a little bit in a second. But now we need to just install all of the gems. This takes from the gem file that's in the repository and automatically installs all the stuff that we need. 
Luckily, I already had it sort of in there. So at this point in time, you should have Xcode installed on your machine. If you don't, it's pretty easy. You go to the Mac App Store. You search Xcode. And then you click Install. It's, uh, it's a fairly large file. I think it's about 2 gigabytes to download or so. So you'll have to take some time to go through that. But it's, uh, it's worth it. You'll, you, again, you won't have to actually do any coding yourself, but it needs the app and it needs all the tooling that goes along with it. So it comes with a bunch of stuff like what's called a compiler, which basically turns the code into the zeros and ones for you. All these sorts of things that it needs to be able to do to actually put the app together. So you'll need to install Xcode. And if you haven't opened it before, do now. Uh, you're going to get a bunch of stuff that says, like, terms of service uh, that you'll have to accept. And then we'll automatically install a bunch of stuff and move everything around for you properly. Just let it do its thing. It'll take a few minutes, but it's worth it. Okay. So once it does its thing, we need to actually tell the whole system that it exists again. It's a little convoluted, but you just copy and paste this over. You type in your password and you're good to go. Nothing else will come up. It just changes a couple of files and links them around. Okay. So the repository comes with a couple of sample images. Um, we can go ahead and go take a look at them if we want. They are going to be found in images. And you'll see a couple in here. So it's a couple samples of some nav bars from some of the earlier applications that I worked on. These are fine for the purpose that we're working on today. But when you're working on your own organization, you're going to want to go in and you're going to want to put your own in. Now, as you see, these are some examples. So the nav bar is going to be wider than it is tall. That's going to go at the top of your app on the navigation bar next to the about buttons and every and search buttons and things like that. So you're going to want to format it so that like the example here for OCCRP, it's has a horizontal title and a logo. The other image that you're going to need is a perfectly square image and it checks this. So make sure that your pixels are exactly equal at, in height and width. And this you want these as large as possible. So for uh, mine, I usually go at least 512 pixels by 512 pixels. Uh, this should theoretically actually be a lot bigger than they are, but these are some of the early ones. And again, they'll work for our purposes today, but make sure your images are big. And then you're going to want to put them into this images folder. This is where it's going to go looking and hunting for them. Again, this is all documented right here. Okay. So now... Setting up the iOS app. Let's hope this goes right. Apple and Google like to change stuff around a little bit. I've done some run-throughs. Should work perfectly the first time. If it doesn't, you'll watch me debug. That's just sort of how it goes. Okay. Caveat. If you're starting a new project, you need to sign up for an Apple developer account. This takes some Time, unfortunately. You need to have one uh, to be able to even build anything, unfortunately. But the hardest part is the DUNS process. I'm not going to step you through what the DUNS process is today. That is going to take a while because the DUNS, because it involves applying for a ID for your company. If you're developing as an individual, you don't need to worry about this, uh, which is what I'm doing uh, today. But if you are working for an organization or something, you're going to want to really look into it. And this can be a little bit challenging, especially if someone previously set up an account because you're only allowed to have one per organization. And I'm not going to get into that process, but you can work it out with Apple yourself. But if you just go to the Apple developer, developer.apple.com, uh, you can start the process of signing up. However, if you just want to get through it, use your personal Apple ID. Okay, so first thing we want to do is 
go up to the main folder that you're putting everything into. We're going to pull the iOS code. Clone it, sorry. It's pretty big. <laughs> there's a lot of history in this. I've been working on it for quite a while, so there's a lot of stuff still sitting around that uh, takes some time. Okay, so while it's pulling that down, what we're going to do is we're going to set up the configuration file. So the first thing that we want to do is rename the configuration file. That's actually wrong as well. No, oh, where is it? Nope, that's right. Okay, so what we can do is we can just take the default one here. We'll rename it, as the instructions say, to uh, pushmobile.yaml. And we'll open this with whatever text editor we prefer. Uh, I'm going to use this one. Text edit works just fine. Zoom in. OK. So this is the main part that actually tells the iOS and Android apps what to look like, what to do, how to do it where to put images, etc. This is this is the heart and soul. So there's a couple things here that we're going to be changing. So let's change this name to push demo. Let's call it, do the same thing here. In, in fact, actually, I know for a fact that that is already taken. So I am going to name it this. Uh, Google screams at you if you eventually use the same name. I know push demo from my exploits last evening is taken, so I'm just going to make this name a little bit more unique for everybody. Just name it after myself since we're going to be using my own company. And we'll do con Christopher guest push demo. And we'll call it the same here. Okay, so as when we were setting up the back end, you have different languages available. We're just going to keep it to English right now, but if you wanted to, for instance, you know, add Russian, you would just do that, and it would automatically include Russian as well. But we'll just keep it with English. I'm not going to make anything too complicated for anybody today. And here is where the icon that we were talking about just a moment ago gets set. So you just want to put the name. You don't want to put the path, just the name. We'll use uh, OCCRPs for the moment. We'll also use their nav bar. So the small is uh, alternative if you have a smaller version. If you don't, don't worry about it. It'll shrink down pretty well from the, uh, from the large icon anyways. We can set the background colors. These are uh, hex numbers, just like you would use in HTML or something like that. So if you set it here, Again, this is all fairly well documented. If you set it for the Android, it will put this as the back end. Uh, the background for the launch page when it first comes up. Your navigation bar and also the text on the navigation bar. So if you want, you know, black on white or white on blue, this is where you're going to modify that. We'll keep it the same for right now, but you can go in and change it as much as you want. There's so a couple other settings here. Uh, some news organizations prefer their authors to stay uh, anonymous, so you can set whether or not it's true. The default is, of course, true because most people would want their authors to get credit, but in some instances, that's not the case. I don't know if The Economist is ever going to use this. Uh, then there's one more part here. So this was designed for one person to be able to manage multiple different organizations because that was my purpose at the beginning. So what you have are suffixes, and this means that you can have different files that do different things. So we're going to set this one to just push as the default, and we're going to change this to creds. Hello. Hi. Hi. Are you really on the air? Yes. 
<laughs> okay, so this this is for simplicity's sake, just for when you're setting up one for yourself, not for you know multiple organizations. But if you do, it does handle that, which is nice. So we're going to set this up, and we're good to go on that. Okay, so now let's go back to the settings. And we're going to uh, change. Now we're going to set up the credentials file. This is the file that actually has all your secret stuff in it. This is the file that is uh, very. Keep it close to your chest. Don't show this to other people. And in fact, I'm going to open it up on a different machine just to make sure nothing accidentally stuck in from what I was doing last night. And then I'll move it over here in a second. Okay, we're good to go. So what we're going to do is we're going to, just like before, we're going to take this template and we're going to rename it to creds.yaml, YML. And we're going to open that up as well. Let's zoom in a little bit. And here is all the secret stuff. So this is really where the connections happen. The previous file is what it looks like. This is what it does. So we are doing we are connecting to pushdemo.codingwithchris.com. Uh, the origin URL, this is the main site. So we are calling it WordPress demo.pushapp.press, I believe. Wait, let me just make sure on that. Yes, I believe so. I'm honestly forgetting from like an hour ago. Yep, that's it. Okay. Oh, although there's no S on this one because I didn't properly set it up, but we'll just forget about that for a minute. There's a couple things here that are a little bit legacy uh, that you can just completely ignore, which is going to be the hockey key, uh, info bip. Those are things that we can just completely ignore for the moment. We're also going to, for the moment, ignore the Google Play Store, uh, YouTube access key, fabric key, Facebook key, PayPal donation URL. Those are things that we don't need to, that we're not going to worry about since we're setting up an iOS app. Although I will go back, uh, I'll take that back a little bit, the donation URL. If you have a page that you can direct people to collect money for your organization, etc., with, you can put that URL in here and it will actually appear as a link in the About page automatically. If you leave it blank, nothing will show up. No harm, no foul. You can always add it later too. Okay, so what we're going to do now is Apple Developer Account Email Address. So we're going to be using my personal one. And we're going to also be adding a, the ID. Um, I also just got very hesitant about putting this in myself. So, hmm. It's okay, none of you know my password anyways. <laughs> so, we'll, we'll have to get that. We'll go into developer.apple.com. Yeah, I just realized it's fine. It probably shows up publicly somewhere. We'll log in. I need to get my Apple password here. That y'all don't see it. Okay. I have two factor turned on, so Luckily, none of you know the password, so you won't be able to get in anyways. Okay. Okay, so now we go to membership, and we copy and paste this right here, team ID, in to here. 
and it gives you instructions exactly right how to do that within the file itself. So, so since I do not have multiple organizations, I have to. Oh, I do have a couple, but. It, um, We'll need to uh, grab this real quickly as well, and we'll follow the instructions here. Zoniness, or we'll do that in a minute. I'm sorry, that's my bad. Again, this process is a little bit uh, convoluted, and so it's sometimes hard to keep track of my own head. But we'll just ignore that for the minute. We're not going to need any of the extra Android stuff to either. So this is as far as we need to go at the moment, and this will set up a majority of the stuff. So let's close out of that. Go back to the settings. Like it says here, those are the things that are most important. You may need to create a couple new folders. We'll try those out. They should be all there. Oh. Oh. That's my bad again. We need to make some of these folders too. So we'll make about, and now we'll touch that. And we need to Again, this will all be updated in the documentation right now. Okay. Now we need to run bundle install. Oh, darn it. That was why. <laughs> so everything I just did doesn't so that uh, that little thing doesn't really matter because I wasn't in the right folder. This happens. So now we'll run these uh, commands again. There we go. OK. Now we'll run bundle install. Make sure. You do this within the push generator folder. That was my mistake. So it goes. Everybody screws up, even if you wrote the darn thing. So, okay. Now we're going to run CocoaPods. Okay. We're going to see if this works. Let me check something real quickly to see where we're sitting. I've been screwing around a little bit with this. Because this project is under active development, obviously. Okay, so what we're going to do is there's one library in here that for some reason uh, the last couple days I've been having some issues while I'm trying to update. So what we're going to do is we're going to pull a copy of it down and then build against that when we're actually doing this. This is super easy. Just follow my instructions and we'll get through it no problem. Uh, it's not. It's just uh, a little bit of a workaround, but we'll get no problem. So what we want to do is we want to go to the folder that has the, that's actually the container folder for the push iOS. So just go up one level, cd dot dot will take you there. And what we're going to do is we're actually going to be uh, pulling a different repository. And I'm just gonna go here to get the link real quickly. And what this does is it's actually a, it's actually a repository for, uh, for Tor. Um, one of the features of push is that 
at least on the iOS side, Android, I'm still trug- I'm still struggling with. If there's anybody out there that wants to help, that'd be awesome. Uh, it will automatically detect if your network is being censored and spin up Tor in the background for your user uh, without them even having to know. It's really phenomenal. Uh, I'm quite proud of it, but it is a little bit um, a little bit off with the repository. So what we're going to do is we're just going to clone a copy of the Tor library that we're using called CPA Proxy, which is phenomenal, and bring it down real quick. This will just take a minute. Unfortunately, we're about to hit that hit another point where everything's going to go sort of quiet for a while because we're going to have to compile things. And because the computer that I'm currently on is a little bit, it's a little MacBook Air here, it's pretty old, uh, it takes a long time to compile, unfortunately. Um, if you're on a modern machine, this will go a lot faster. But because this was the machine that we had available, considering it's now summer break here at the University of Missouri, uh, we, we take what we can get. So... Just give me a minute, but now that we've pulled CPA proxy, we can go back into the iOS library, and we can continue to follow the instructions that are in here. So if we do pod update, this uses what's called CocoaPods. It's another package manager, but specifically for iOS, not for your system. Uh, it's sort of like Bundler, like we were running for uh, Ruby, but instead it works for Swift and Objective-C. And this, this is gonna take a while, but I'll step you through the first couple of minutes and then I'm gonna probably step out for a little bit while it continues to compile and we'll go from there. So right now what it's doing is it's updating, again, all of the master repositories that the system actually is using. So to make sure that it's asking for the right versions, to make sure, you know, see if it has old versions and make sure that it has the most recent updated versions, et cetera. So we're just going to let this happen a little bit. It's using Git, as you can see here, which is actually sort of cool. Uh, it's a piece of software that's, use, that's useful in so many different features. Um, yeah. Okay, so this is the part that's going to take a while. You can actually see right here at the top all of the uh, different settings and comp compilations and everything that's doing. But right now, I am going to take a step out. And we're back. It is compiling a couple more things real quickly. The Facebook SDK share kit. I can probably remove that at some point in these days, but uh, we'll get around to it. Next, we run bundle update to make sure that all the libraries that we require for the iOS is uh, actually in there. Specifically, the big one that's going to be that we're going to be adding is something called Fastlane. That's a project um, that's phenomenal. I think it's owned by Twitter now, maybe. But essentially what it is is it's a series of libraries and plugins that let you automatically sign code, handle certificates, basically do a lot of stuff automatically and from scripts that you would normally have to log into an Apple website to do or an Android site to do. And it gets really frustrating. Um, and this allows me to just abstract most of that away for yourself, for myself, saves a lot of time. Okay. So now we want to go back to the generator library. Now that we have that set up. And we're going to try and build the iOS app. Let's see how this goes. Oh, no unique. That's my bad. In the settings, I am using an old version of the, oh, no, that's not what we want. I am missing a setting 
in the, I believe, credentials. Let me verify that. <laughs> yes. Yes. I need to update that in the template. In fact, I will do so right now. Oh, it should be in there. Okay. So that means we need to go in. Let me just add one thing. So what this is, is this is actually a, another little piece for the um, push notifications. Instead of using a system that, uh, that handles everything for you yourself, itself, like say Urban Airship or uh, some of Google's offerings, what this does is it actually uses an open source project called Unikush. And normally this isn't a big, normally you wouldn't need this, but because Push is designed to be able to handle multiple installations on the same servers, we used a uh, suffix, basically, and I forgot to set it. So, uh, it was not in the older version of the template. It should be in the newer version. I'll make sure of that this afternoon. Uh, so you should never run into this. You just set it as Push, and you should be good to go. But that fixes that problem right now. Okay. So it is running a little bit. There we go. So while that's happening, I'll explain what this is. So bundle exec is just a piece of Ruby code that basically makes sure that you're using the right amount of ge uh, gems and such things. Ruby, obviously. Then push.rb is the file that actually runs the is the generator file. It's a mass amount of code, and there's a bunch of different types of flags to it and different modes and functions, and we're going to go through most of those in the next uh, little bit here. But the big ones that you're seeing here are development mode, and then the mode, so it handles both iOS and Android. So if dot dash m goes to iOS, then you need to set the directory for the iOS project that you have, and that's what that does. Pretty simple. And if you run into some problems, here's some steps. However, we're good to go. Everything seems to be up and running. It worked, it ran through all the different steps from Fastlane, as you can see here. And so now we're going to open up Xcode and try it out. we do this right, we should have something that actually builds in the next uh, couple minutes here, okay? So we're going to go into our push iOS app and we're gonna open that up. It's gonna load everything in, I'm gonna verify that everything's working. And let's try it in the simulator. So once you're in Xcode, to actually launch the app into a simulator, so it's not your real, it's not your real device, it's not this, but it's, uh, it's one that, go, that works underneath it. You can do this. Go to product and run. So this is going to go through. Now it's going to compile everything that we didn't compile before. So it should only take a minute. There's a couple errors. Most of that has to do with uh, the libraries that we've already that were included. So not my fault, unfortunately. There's not much I can do for some of these things. Um, however, if you notice, this my code's pretty clean, more or less. So now it's launching the simulator. 
It's not going to lie, the simulator is going to go pretty slowly at this point in time. Um, this is not the fastest ma fastest machine in the world, as I mentioned before. Um, and so running an entire mobile operating system simulator within it, plus all the extra stuff that's going on, it's, it takes a big turn out of the uh, out of the app, so or out of the machine itself. So it's going to take a little bit of time to boot up, but we should see it fully functional in just a minute here. And there we are. There's the logo that we set. Again, because it's running on such a slow machine, it takes a little bit of time to actually uh, to actually boot. Nor if I was putting onto my uh, my personal iPhone or my iPad here, this would be instant. But I'll just give it a little time since I can't really uh, stream my phone to you. This will be what we'll have to work with. There we are, it's loading, and we get a 500 error. Okay, these things happen, so we need to figure out what was causing it. Let's see. Let's see if we were getting any error messages. Nope, everything seems to be fine there. So uh, let's just try one more time and see what happens. Sometimes things just get a little wonky for the first uh, for the first launch, especially if the machine, the computer's so slow. Things can get a little bit. Let's see what is causing that 500. See, this is the one I built last night. <laughs> Works fine then. You know what, when something like this is happening, what it is, is it's an error with the back end that we set up. So let's test the back end real quickly. Why don't we push? We can just go articles.json. That will actually give us that. Okay, so next we do. Oh, looks like it was a typo in our back end configuration file. If you notice here, it says HH. That is my bad. So, pretty easy to fix this. Because all we do is we go back in, like we did before, to our back end. So, push demo.coding with chris.com slash dash I. Okay, so now we're back in. So these things happen. Don't you don't get discouraged while you're doing it. Uh, there, you just have to sort of nail down and figure out what's happening. And if you are having problems, you can always tweet at me, or you can put an issue up on the GitHub pages, and I'll get back to you as soon as I possibly can to uh, try to work out the project with you as much as possible. So since we're seeing this error right here, that means that it's not able to get. The articles, which is fine. We can just do this. We will edit that file that we created earlier. And there it is. There is our errant H. So we'll just exit out. We will then bring down the Docker file, the Docker containers that we had before. Just stop them all. Get rid of it. Could reload, but let's just clean it out. Make it easy. Excuse me. Had a bit of a lunch break there. And now we'll just put him back up again. Okay. Now we'll give it a minute just to fully boot. And there we go. Problem solved. So if we go back in here and we pull down to refresh. There we go. We have our full first story that's coming in from the back end. We don't have any test data in there. Uh, the test 
one doesn't have an image in it or anything like that. But I can guarantee you that all that would be working if we did have that test data put in. So the, now we have fully testable apps that you can install on your own personal devices for iOS. And we'll talk about production uh, in a little bit. 